night, everybody. Hail and welcome back to this very special episode of Midgard Musings. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Jesse, and I'm the host here on this channel. If you're into Germanic paganism, Norse heathenry, what's usually referred to as a saw true, also true, whatever, uh, please subscribe to the channel down below. Click the bell for notifications, that way you don't miss anything. Um, today's video is a very special one, like I said, because it is another collaboration video between myself and Eric Shervin over at the Ravens Call. So um, this has been something that we've been wanting to do now for a little while. The um, scheduling of it, you know, it's been just a little bit challenging to nail down specifics, but we finally got together for this collaboration of uh, Eric and I answering all of your questions. Now, um, an AMA or Ask Me Anything video has a bit of an organic sort of approach to it. Um, you're going to see uh, the screen flip back and forth between Eric and I as we were talking, um, but we're going to go through and answer all the questions that we collectively got um, over the last month or two between both of our channels um, and other social media, uh, mostly including Facebook, I believe. So between Facebook and YouTube comments or posts, um, we're going to be answering a lot of the, the questions that we got um, over a two-part video. So this video is part one, and uh, part two is going to be published over on Eric's channel. So everybody needs to make sure that you have subscribed to The Raven's Call. There's going to be cards that are uh, going to be annotated along the way throughout this video, as well as information in the end screen. It is a bit of a longer video, um, but once we got rolling and once we got into you know talking and discussing and answering questions, um, it was a very fun experience, I had a lot of fun, and I want to just thank Eric for, first of all, you know, making himself available for this. Um, and also I want to thank each and every one of you who took the time to answer some questions, um, or answer, ask questions, I should say, for us to answer. So it was a really fun experience, I'm looking forward to this. Um, so you guys, when you have about an hour or so's worth um, for part one, and then another hour at least for part two, um, I hope you enjoy the questions um, that we are answering here and, and what we were able to deliver. Hopefully it's going to help everybody because um, there were some really great questions that were posed to us. So thank you everyone for being a part of this uh, and thank you Eric for collaborating with me. Uh, so here we go guys and gals, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, part one of the AMA collaboration video between myself and Eric Wordweaver Shervin. Enjoy. All right, everybody, hail and welcome to this special collaboration between Eric Wordweaver Shervin and myself. Uh, you guys have watched, I think, both of our content enough to know who we are, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, introduce myself yet again. You guys are into, you know, Norse heathenry and Germanic paganism, what is usually modern in modern times now referred to as also true. I uh, invite you to please click the subscribe button down below. Make sure you ding the bell for notifications so that we are always notified. Uh, when I upload new content. Um, but like I said, today's video is going to be with a collaboration uh, of a uh, very good, I, I, I'm going to say, and Eric can, uh, can jump in here, but I'm going to say a good friend of mine. Um, we haven't met in person yet, um, but we talk almost daily to some extent or some degree. And um, I've learned a lot from him, and this is our second collaboration of hopefully more to come. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric and give him the chance to um, introduce himself and take it away, Eric. Hey guys, this is Eric Ward Weaver Shervin, Gothi of the Ridgar Folk here in East Texas. I am the host of The Raven's Call. Many of you have watched that already, depending on which channel you're watching this on in the first place. Uh, Jesse's an awesome dude, and he was so kind as to invite me to come over here and do this AMA with him today. And I am just thrilled as can be. So you guys can see I'm filming out in the wilderness again. So forgive the sound of cicada and birds. That is just how things go when you're in Texas and you roll deep. So howdy, y'all. Jesse, let's kick it. Awesome. Yeah, so guys, like Eric had said, um, this video, and as you've seen by the thumbnail and, and whatnot, is an AMA or Ask Me Anything uh, sort of thing. And this has been uh, kind of in the works now for a little while, um, and we're just now finally able to set the time down and uh, or set the time aside and sit down and, and, and rock it out. So uh, we've got a list of questions from some of you folks who have um, uh, either sent them in through uh, email or, or YouTube comments or Facebook page or group comments um, and we're going to go through and try to answer them as best we can. Um, so the first one um, that I've got on our list came as a Facebook comment from Patrick Walsh 
And uh, Patrick's uh, question was, is it wrong to call two different gods or goddesses in a single ritual? Um, and I think what we're going to do here, guys, is we're going to kind of both answer each of these questions. It's not an exceptionally long list, and I think you guys will enjoy the, the feedback from, from each of us. Um, so I'm going to let Eric start with it if you want, and then we'll kind of just go back and forth a little. Heck yeah. Uh, that's actually a pretty good question. I've, I've had people ask me that before, especially newbies, when it comes to uh, really getting the feel for how to do ritual. And I know in a lot of the neo-pagan traditions, it's not uncommon for somebody to hail multiple gods or goddesses within a ritual. And I am, I am one to say, absolutely, it's fine to hail more than one in a ritual. As a matter of fact, most of my rituals involve multiple. Um, in that I am usually hailing the tribe of the gods as a whole. Uh, there are specific times of year when I will single somebody out because that seems to be the the focus on that time of year. Uh, like around Ostra, which we call Lifka in my tribe, we tend to do uh, offerings to Adul and uh, whatnot. But it's not uncommon, especially if you're doing like protection rituals for the house or something like that, to, to uh, hail both Thor for protection and Frigga for the home element of things. So yeah, absolutely. I would say it's very appropriate. The sticky situation that you get into, that is the way I see it, is when you're dealing with like some of the neo-pagans will do where they're mixing pantheons. That I'm a little more dodgy on. Uh, I, I have no problem with multiples in the same ritual, like within the Aesir. But mm -hmm. as far as pulling in like Celtic gods or goddesses in the same ritual, I mean, it's it's a not my hall, not my call kind of thing, uh, but that's one that I'm a little little more uncomfortable with, simply because as an honorific to the gods, since you know it's to the ace here that I pledge my troth, uh, I, I find it's more respectful to keep it in house when I'm doing that. Jesse, what's your take? Yeah, man? yeah, I'm 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 similar in that way, Eric. And, and as a matter of fact, I've um I think it also can uh, for me it can also depend on the purpose behind the ritual and what. Uh, what you mean to, um, you know, wh what goal are you shooting for? What's the purpose behind the ritual? Um, I've done rituals, uh, and for, for, like Eric was saying, like specific times of year for, for certain um, holy tides where I choose to observe them, um, they're going to be very focused on a god or goddess or maybe a couple gods or goddesses. But overall, I think an acknowledgement to the greater tribe um, is, is definitely appropriate. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been one to, in some of my ritual, um, as, a, as a sort of protection or a ward of the sacred space that I declare, is to uh, give a particular nod to Hemdal, you know, as, as a watchman, um, you know, just to kind of be that silent watch, watchman uh, to keep the, the baleful whites or the whatever you want to refer to them as away from, from that sacred space that we declare. So I'm in agreement. I think that it is... Um, not wrong, um, depending on the situation, to uh, to call on all or or more than one of the gods or goddesses, and um, so yeah, I think we're in agreement on that. Um, so the next question is that um, comes from a YouTuber um, or on a, on the YouTube comments, and this is from Nicholas Leclerc, I believe. So he said, and his question is specifically directed to the both of us, and he says. Do you feel aligned with any particular group of gods or spirits, or do you feel more like you are at the middle of opposing groups of gods or spirits? And I think maybe I could be wrong, but it's almost it's almost looking like a question of are you do you work with both the Aesir and the Vanir or uh, Aesir and the Jotun or right, Jotnar right. Uh, sort of thing? So why don't you feel this one first, Jesse? Yeah, I um. I'm I'm one of the types of of pagans or heathens who, um, I I work with both Aesir and Vanir tribes um, because they've coexisted and they, and they cohabitate uh, in their own working way. There's there's not a um, they're they're both uh, tribes of order, if you will, and then you've got you know the Aesir being more of the warrior class and the and the, the war cult type gods, and then you've got the Vanir who are more agriculturally driven and, and things pertaining to the land and um, so I feel that working with those two tribes of the gods and goddesses definitely mesh um, 
I'm not one to combine uh, or blend, um, you know, uh, Aesir Vanir and Jotnar type of, of, of gods or goddesses or, or figures. Um, so, and it's not that I feel opposed to doing that. I just don't feel like the, uh, I guess it is a bit of an opposition if you cut it right down to the chase, but I think that it's, you know, you got to keep order with order and the chaos elements of the Jotnar uh, being brought in could just wreak havoc in the, the workings of your ritual and the workings of your, you know, trying to establish Frith with those sacred figures. So, Eric, what do you say? Jesse, I am, uh, I, I'm very similar in this. Uh, I, I am, I pledge my troth to the Aesir. That's, that's the tribe to whom I pledge my fealty and the tribe with whom I try to exchange energies and luck with uh, for the betterment of my tribe. So because the Aesir themselves are allied with the Vanir and we are allied with the Aesir, we end up with uh, kind of a tangential alliance with the Vanir, uh, especially since there are members of the Vanir in with the Aesir tribe at this point. They are bound by oath after the war, and in such, to honor one is to honor the other, as it were. Um, I think that going with mythic parody, looking at, you know, in conjunction with the mythos that still, that has been passed down to us, the distinction between the two is much less uh, pronounced after the war. So as far as Aesir Vanir, yeah, I, I have no problem mixing with them. Honestly speaking, the only Vanir we really have names for at this point are in with the tribe. Those are the ones that got recorded because the sagas record the saga of the Aesir. Um, that being said, you know, we've got Thror and Troya and Njord, and then that's you know, we, we don't venture very far out when it comes to the Vanir. But, you know, you've got UPG uh, interpretations and things like that. So I do have kind of UPG versions of where the Vanir ended up within the general kind of popular mythos. And so, but that's a conversation for another day. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally down with uh, blending Aesir and Vanir, but I do not by any means uh, venture into the Jotun. Uh, outside of those that have been brought into the tribe, because I'm very tribal focused. Uh, everything that I do is based on tribe. So if they are allied with the tribe of the gods, then they are kind of fair game, as it were. If they're not allied with the tribe, or they're outlawed by the tribe, or they're an adversary to the tribe, then they are my adversary, because in order to honor my oaths and my dedication to the gods and their tribe, I need to honor their alliances and their oppositions within that respect. So I don't go into the Jotnar side of things as far as the, you know, the baleful whites and the, uh, the baleful Jotnar, that of course you can't just flat out say, I don't include any Jotnar because, you know, Freuer is married to Gerd and, you know, you've got Skadi who is of, of Jotun blood. Thor is half Jotun himself. Sure. So you, you see where I'm going with that. Yep. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's you know, not, not like a, a cut and dry scenario by any means because uh, for the different reasons that you stated, you know, you've got some Jotunars who um, have allied with the, the Aesir or in some way and, and have produced offspring as such. Um, so, I mean, the, you know, you look at um, <laughs> the... the Emir, you know what I mean? The very first mm. of the primordial uh, right. sacred, you know, is just... So I think here's... Prima sacrifice. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Great question, though, uh, Nicholas. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Um, so next question is going to be from Lee Guerrero on YouTube as well. Came through as a YouTube uh, comment. And his question says, uh, my girlfriend and I just watched a show that talks about real experiences of paranormal hauntings. What is the explanation uh, with this, with with Norse heathenry? I think maybe what he's looking for is, um, does anything like that exist in this? <laughs> yeah, know, that right? one's a doozy. That one's fun. That's a doozy. You want to go first? Sure. Um, I, uh, as far as the explanation of it, I think that you know the, these hauntings, these uh, examples of uh, those no longer with us in the physical sense. Um, or, or, or big, um, entities that exist in uh, some form or way within the sacred um, 
continue to hang around. Um, and I've done videos, I think Eric has done videos on the complexity um, behind the parts of self, you know, the soul complex and, and where various parts of us end up or go once our physical selves die. Um, I definitely think there has a place uh, with these, you know, paranormal experiences, these paranormal things, um, both good and bad, you know, both, both, both uh, experiences that you're going to face that are, um, make you feel good or feel positive about the presence of that paranormal entity. And then there's others that are going to be uh, um, not so good feeling um, and negative feeling. So, you know, we've got, <laughs> this could be a whole uh, video in and of itself. I think if we, especially when you get talking into like the, the aspects of like the Draugr, you know, and, and, and that kind of stuff. So it, my short answer, what is its explanation in North Uh That's a deep question to answer uh, or a long question to answer, but it does, it does exist and, and, and it is there. And I've, I've personally had experiences that um, could venture into the realm of the paranormal um, and, and exchanging some sort of existence or sharing existence with these um, these spirits or, or these whites, if you will. So, Eric, what do you say? My, my answer is, Trauger, Trauger. No, uh, <laughs> I, I am absolutely, uh, I, I'm one of those crazy guys that is, you know, ghosts are real, uh, Draugr's are real. Uh, these, these spiritual entities are real. Anybody that has worked with the spiritual plane as well as the physical plane knows this to be true. So, you know, yeah, there's there's all the paranormal activity stuff. Most of those shows are hokum. Um, I don't really give them the time of day because it's all charlatanry and whatnot. But but the actual events do occur. I mean, I've had some experiences myself. I don't usually talk about them on the air, but you know, that is part of the woo woo side of things. Um, you know, I've I've broken down in my soul complex videos that. The different aspects of the soul complex dissipate into different areas. Energies can remain in ways that that still have a presence on Midgard, because a vast majority of the soul complex actually remains in the the physical plane anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's mostly profane energies. Right. Uh, you've got like with the lich, the body when it passes. If there's any of that old still in there. It is an animating force, and if the rest of the soul complex has dissipated, then boom. You got Draugr. You want Draugr? That's how you get Draugr. <laughs> but as far as the Hammer and things like that still existing within the space, yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of the, well, I think all of the spectral visions that we have, the, the ghosts, the hauntings, and things like that are those, the, the Hammer aspect of the soul complex that has still stuck around. And then in some essences, there's energies that have locked onto a specific item and that's its tie to the material plane. It's all energies. Things resonate and especially within the profane physical world, there's only so much that it can do and so much that it can go. So it, it's natural there will be some remnants here and there. And if uh, you're talking about something as potent and powerful as spiritual energy, it's going to have some very interesting manifestations. I mean, if you look at the sagas themselves, the sagas are rife with ghost hauntings and Draugr. I mean, our ancestors believed in this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they wrote it as they experienced stuff. And there's enough that is absolutely true <laughs> in the sagas that we found. I mean, heck, they thought they found Egil's skull at one point in time with the axe marks that, that mar matches up with his legendary blow to the head. I mean, there's enough stuff that matches up with the sagas. It, it makes you wonder just by its accounting alone. Uh, they're they're continuing to find more and more stuff that supports the the factualness of the sagas, and there's some fantastical stuff in there. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's my heathen explanation for paranormal stuff. It's <laughs> real and it all exists within a heathen context. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you know, I'm gonna be, um, you know, as folks are watching, there's gonna be cards that are annotated um, up in the top right of your screen um, to videos that Eric's done, myself probably as well. So be sure to yeah, check out those annotated cards. I'm jealous. That's more difficult for me to do on the phone setup. So you got me beat on all that. They'll be there. <laughs> They'll be there for... <laughs> your swanky rig and all. <laughs> it's an internal thing for with YouTube. Um, it's a neat feature. I don't know how to do it on the mobile app or if it is available. I, know, I don't think app, you can. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you can. All the end screens and stuff like that. Those are always cool. Yeah. Um, great. So um, the next one comes also as a YouTube uh, comment, the uh, Western Raven. 
Um, this question, the, all these questions are, are from, you know, about, I would say at this point now, a month or so ago, but um, still relevant. He says, I've been feeling ancestors a lot lately. How about you? Eric, why don't you start? Dude, I am always feeling the ancestors. That is, uh, that is probably my most prevalent thing is uh, the ancestors are with us. I get up every morning and I do an offering to my husvet here, my housewife, my hearth god, and I do offerings to my ancestors and touch base with them every day. And uh, usually I feel like when the veil is thin in the fall and the winter times is when I feel the pull the strongest. Um, but with everything that's been going on lately, and I think that's kind of what he's getting to, uh, yeah, I, I do think there is some strong presence from the ancestors these days looking out for people and wanting to uh, to support, push that luck on to their descendants so that everything continues to do okay. Because even regardless of how it plays out with the whole situation going on, there's still you know jobs and things to consider like that afterwards. And any luck that the ancestors can pass on helps to perpetuate the success and well-being of their descendants. And they have a vested interest in our succeeding and continuing on because we are their legacy. So yeah, absolutely. I think anytime we have situations of global significance, uh, that the ancestors are definitely with us and, and paying some extra attention to us. And I for one appreciate that very much. Yes. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, and it's, a. Uh... It's kind of an interesting thing to note, you know, just the global climate being what it is and um, everybody's um, been a lot more drawn inward to their respective homes be just because of, you know, executive orders and, and things like that from various governments that have instructed people to stay put. Um, so it's kind of like it's an opportunity, I think, that you would um, be remiss in, in taking advantage of to really connect with your ancestors at this point because you're you've been isolated and, and, and kind of forced to focus inward and, and within the home, you know, you have the opportunity to really connect. Um, I do too. I do too. Um, with, uh, respect to my ancestors and, and stuff, because it's such a, it's such an important part it is as equal to, I think I've, I've been wanting to say this, it's as equal, if not more important than your dedication to the gods themselves. Um, because as Eric said, you know, your ancestors, our ancestors are, directly tied through us you know the or log that gets passed down and stuff is it's it's all directly to us they they have that vested interest they want to see the luck and um all that maintain and continue on um so yes i've definitely feel their presence more so now um and and it's exciting because it makes me want to continue that relationship and, and maintain that and build on that so i hope everybody who's watching it gets uh or, or is taking advantage and, and realizes the importance of honoring our ancestors because um, that's going to build and strengthen a good roots, you know, build and strengthen good roots um, with your, with your heathen practices. Um, so the next one is an interesting one. And this comes from Damien Damien on YouTube as well. Um, and he says um, as an anti-racist slash anti-fascist who is, a magical student and learning the Nordic arts. Um, do you think that we can reclaim the idea of the black sun in a non-racial way? So the, it's a big question. There's actually a lot more to this that we just kind of <laughs> trimmed down. You did a pretty good job of parsing that down. <laughs> <laughs> and and thank you, Damien. Damien, who was very meticulous in the, in your delivery of it. Um, I don't think anything that I'm delivering right now is going to take away from what you were talking about. It was just some of the just in it interest of condensing it for time right and um, i have read the full question damien so wrong um eric i think we've even talked about stuff like this you might have even done a video about uh, maybe not particularly the black uh, sun but just symbols that i i have done some on symbols um i actually have plans to do one on this general subject the reclaiming of uh, of symbols and so i don't know how much of that'll go into right here but um my my take on it is that and this is just kind of the basics of symbols symbols only have value when they are perceived by the user the in, the individual uh, the rune on a tree is meaningless until it is perceived by someone 
and then the energies that you put into it are where the energies of the room come from. Um, it's the psychic energies that we place into it. It's a charging kind of thing. It's the power that that symbol wells up within our psyche. And so when you're talking about symbols that have been heavily tainted, that have been uh, abused, <laughs> to say the least, um, there's a lot of psychic baggage there. There really is. And the problem that we run into with those is, and I'll go into more detail on this when I do a full video, but the problem that we run into it is you've got a global view. You've got millions of people looking at this symbol and imbuing it with the meaning that they attach to it. And so there's no way you're not aware of that meaning as well. So whatever you, you view the symbol, you're doing mental gymnastics to try and keep that kind of taint out of it. Is it possible to reclaim that symbol for yourself? Yes, it is possible to reclaim that symbol. For anything that you're going to use in the public, you would have to fight the public zeitgeist and the yeah. gestalt that is associated therewith. And they're going to pour in a lot more energy with hundreds and thousands of views to, you know, charge that, that symbol and thusly destroy what it was you were trying to do in the first place. So yes and no, it's a complicated thing. And like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of ins and outs to it as far as the actual mechanics at play, but you know, it can be, it's a generational thing if you want to try and get it back into the generalized use. I mean, uh, the, the example that I use frequently is the swastika. Uh, which, yeah. as we know, the, the black sun and the swastika are not the same thing. The sun wheel, the field fault. And uh, it's so heavily tainted <laughs> after World War II that it's going to be probably generations before that symbol is usable again, even though so many different cultures used that symbol or a variant of it. And so it's been charged for generations with this other energy, but this one toxic event was just so massive and so global and is still so fresh to us. I mean, it's in the higher layers in the well. Uh, we got to reach deeper in the well to connect to those old energies. And you have to get through this filter that occurred around World War II. And so, you know, reaching through that filter, you're not going to pull that symbol back without some taint on it. So, yeah. you know, can he? Yeah. Is it going to happen in the next couple of generations? Probably not. Uh, Want to reuse it for your haul? Not my haul, not my call. But mm -hmm. if you do anything in the public with it, in the public eye, expect, expect some, some flashback. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty much on the same page with it. And I think that, you know, the, like you were saying, how the power of, 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 of symbols is only garnered when you put that much energy into it or when you put that much focus or that kind of uh, attention to it. And, and in the same way, it's, I think um, the naming of things, you know, how we give power to it through the naming of something. Um, I have a, <clears throat> over here in the corner, you can't see it all the time, but it's usually in my videos. I, you know, have a staff or whatever that I walk with and, you know, it's it's marked with runes to name it, um, but it gives power to me for, and, and power to that item. It's is it is it powerful as itself? No, it's a piece of wood with some runes etched into it. As a standalone thing, it, it means nothing. What it, what the meaning behind it, the power, the symbols, and everything is is imbibed into it when I put that put that effort into it. So, in a similar way, you know, we've run into this type of stuff with our the th the hammer, you know, with, with Mjolnir, even with the runes, right. you know. So, um, oh yeah, we're fighting a big thing with the runes online right now. So, yeah, almost. I mean, and and, I, and I've seen some. Some crazy things of uh, some of people getting screenshots of an image that they shared. Um, one recently was an old painting of Odin on Sleipnir and has absolutely nothing. I mean, it's a guy on a horse with a winged helmet and a spear and stuff like nothing. That's just it's an Arthur Rackham. <laughs> it, it's it's nothing inherently that I would see would be called uh, you know that would be flagged as violating community standards, but somehow it did, and I'm like. You need to fix your algorithm or something because this is bogus, <laughs> you know. Definitely weird. So, I'm going to uh, pr continue on now. We got a question. Uh, Century Man 398 H is the YouTuber who who asked this. It says, "How do you study to become a competent rune reader or Vitki?" We have another question that's going to probably. Um, work itself into this one as well of similar ways um 
and I'm the one, and I'm the type, I guess, that is, uh, you know, how do how do we study for 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 anything? You know, you're gonna you got to do your homework, you got to read. But when it comes to like reading runes and and you know the title of Vitki, as it were, um, there's a lot more to it than that. And I feel that you got to have a uh, a valid reason. You know, it's it's I've, I've talked about this before in other videos. Don't think that you know, oh, because you've you've entered into uh, pursuing heathenry as a as a faith way, that you just have to buy a set of runes and start reading runes and start learning the runes. It's a specialized thing that should be, um, I, I think anyway, that should be, you know, focused um, by a specific individual or individuals and not everybody should be um, or would be, you know, drawn to want to do it. So aside from, you know, just your reading material, it's you have to literally spend time. It's, it's like with any craft, right? A blacksmith needs to spend time at the anvil to perfect their craft. You know, the, the, the carpenter needs to be around his materials and, and his tools to perfect his, his skill. Um, a, a seamstress or, or the, the, the weaver of, of wool and things on the loom, you know, they have to be at the thing, doing the thing to improve their work with it. So it's about spending time with the runes and, and handling them and working with them and even carving them yourselves or, or burning them into wood yourselves like what I do. Um, so it's a, it's a, like a, almost a daily practice of improving and learning. So it's, it's more than just reading. It's, it's getting into the meat of it all and then putting your hands and getting your hands dirty, <laughs> as it were. Um, so what do you think, Eric? I am complete, completely in agreement here. Uh, when you're working with the runes, I mean, it, it's a loaded question to ask how do you become a competent rune user. It depends on which way you're using the runes partially. I mean, if you're looking at them as a divinatory use or if you're looking for magical equations and things like that, if you're looking at warding charms, bind runes, if you're looking at using it for linguistic purposes, each of these functions is different. They all fall with under, under the kind of umbrella of rune work. Because um, from a... Uh, a person who's trying to study the runes for like linguistic purposes, it's a different game. You've really got to pay attention to the phonetics and the structure and understand they were never used for English or more complex languages. Uh, and depending on which futhark you're using, if you're looking at, you know, for divinatory purposes, I would say exactly study. Uh, don't study anything that has Ralph Bloom's name on it. If it has Ralph Bloom's name on it, set it on fire and throw yeah. it out the window. Uh, it's pretty but it's absolutely useless. So take that blank rune, stick it in your pocket, save it as an extra in case you happen to break one or lose one. <laughs> the rest of that, yeah, there's no such thing as a blank rune. The rune is a symbol. There, there's no such thing as a blank. But when you're talking about divinatory purposes, I would say that the rune as a symbol and what it, a, any kind of tool for divinatory purposes is simply a honing mechanism for your own psyche and your own sensitivity to the energies of weird and the flow of weird. So yes, study other people's interpretations of the runes. Um, look, to the, look to the old rune poems and things like that, but understand that your own interpretation of what it means to you is far more important than what a book says it's supposed to mean because it's not trying to communicate with the book. It's a symbol that's trying to pull up specific energies from your own psyche and your own connection to the flow of weird. Um, similarly, if you're going to be using them for magical purposes, read as many different sources as you can, figure out how many umpteen jillion different things it's associated with, and then kind of figure out the generalities, why it's associated with these things. Look to the old room poems and see why. Study. Study and experience, but don't get so wrapped up in what other people have written that you discount your own experience because that's what it's about. It's your journey. It's not someone else's journey. Nobody can tell you you're doing it wrong with your interpretations. I mean, they can, but it doesn't matter. It's your haul. It's your call. Right. You, you, you do you, and things will be all right. People may disagree with you, but it, you will find that if you go with your interpretations on things, uh, the effects will be what you want them to be because it's your energies that it's connected with so there you go yeah i like that answer too and it's you know to me it's i think it's even written down in one of the was it uh Ege, was it um ego saga where the runes do not lie or the runes never lie and mm -hmm. it's you know it's it's literally like you could have four or five different people 
reading a casting or reading a rune draw or reading runes that are probably all individually going to come up with different variations of their respective meanings or what they collectively mean because that's a big thing about reading runes and is, is is reading them entirely and not just looking at them individual but seeing how they work together um, yeah, it's a very organic gestalt yeah but you probably get different responses and different answers from different ones but they are all right <laughs> they all have a, a valid um thing so you know Learn from, learning from people who are how have been doing it for a while, I think maybe another way, um, because it also this this question I'm going to just move over to a, a Facebook uh, comment by uh, Mark Henson, and he asks, how do you become a Gothi or Vidki? So I feel like this th that question that we just answered yeah, leads into this one. Yeah, it kind of dovetails into this uh, this question too, and it's I think the answers are going to be similar um, because it's you know learning from them. Kind of like almost being an apprentice, if you will, uh, if you can be be guided in that sort of way to to learn uh, and, and build your own craft. Um, that's how masters of, of crafts become masters, as they study under a master as an apprentice. So I think there may be something worth mentioning about that. And um, with this type of thing is going to be a little bit different because we're not necessarily talking about physical crafts or, or physical things. We're looking at more things that have to do with um, spirituality, you know, Gothi being the the priest class um, sort of role. And I think Eric can probably speak well on this since his position in his tribe is that of Gothi. So Eric, why don't you fill in some right. more of the blanks there? Uh, the, uh, the question of how do I become a Gothi? Uh, do, you, do you do it? <laughs> the essence of it is you always got to go to the why. Why do I want to be a Gothi? What and what am I trying to do? What am I trying to achieve here? And that will tell you the path that you need to go. Because part of it is understanding what a Gothi is. You know, Gothi is, like Jesse said, it's a priest class. And it is a craftsman. The craft of the priest class is the craft of ritual. The job of the Gothi is to refine and develop ritual structure, ritual studies, and connections with the gods and goddesses and the spirit world of the profane. By doing these things, they are honing their craft of being able to forge that connection to the sacred or across the veil into the spirit realm. And so there are different techniques that can be used. Uh, there's different kind of interpretations of how you go about ritual. And someone who earns the title of Gothi is somebody who their tribe has recognized this is our specialist on a ritual. This is the individual who helps us connect and helps us have better rituals. We can learn from him on how, or her, for Githius, uh, we can learn from them on how to develop our home rituals better, and we can continue to develop as a tribe because this individual is constantly focused on how do I make my tribe's connection to the tribe of the gods better and how do i hone in that connection between our tribes through the ritual uh, avenues because otherwise if you don't have somebody whose job it is to study and innovate on those things uh, ritual stagnates uh, with anything you've got to have somebody who's dedicated to a craft for there to be innovation in a craft and there does need to be innovation within your tribe with regards to ritual. Otherwise, you'll always be doing the rituals that you did at the beginning, and things won't get better and stronger as you go along. The only people that can tell you when you are a Gothi is your own tribe. Don't, don't let some national org tell you that you have to pass their class and study this and study that. No, that, they don't have a call on whether or not you're the Gothi of your tribe. Only your tribe has that say. So when you have earned the title, in the eyes of your tribe, when you can say, I am a Gothi and your tribe members don't laugh or roll their eyes, then you have earned that title. When they start to call you that, that's when you know that you've reached that point. Now, my tribe's a little bit different in that our Gothi, our Gothi role is a little more along the Icelandic side of things where it's a mixture of Gothi and chieftain. So not only do I have to continuously focus on the development of ritual, I also have to focus on the administrative side of things as far as managing the tribe and the growth and betterment of the tribe. A lot of tribes will have a distinction between ruling class and priest class, and you'll have a chieftain or a chiefness, or, and then the Gothi is separate, Githya. And then there may be separate, like you may have a Vitki, 
It's aside from that, a spare corner, a shared corner. You may have all these things that serve specific roles within the tribe, uh, but you earn them by studying and doing. Absolutely, the biggest thing is doing. You can be smart. You can study all day long with regards to ritual structure. You can know all the ins and outs. You can have read all of the books that everybody says are the ones you have to read. Uh, but if you aren't skilled at the actual craft of conducting a ritual, uh, you're ineffective as a goatee. You need to be able to actually do the ritual. And so do rituals, do a lot of rituals, and enjoy doing rituals. If you don't enjoy doing rituals, you don't need to be a goatee. If you don't get set on fire by, hey, there's this really cool way to reinterpret how we send our gifts to the gods, that doesn't just like amp you up. Yeah. You don't need to be a goatee. <laughs> That's kind of my take on it. So, uh, but don't let anybody else tell you. Um, the, the old adage is you can say you're a goatee when you can say you're a goatee and nobody in the room laughs. Mm -hmm. um, that is true, but only if that room only consists of your tribe and your in and uh, Because I don't care what anybody else says. P people will come through any day of the week and tell me that I'm not worthy to be a Godi because I haven't met whatever their ridiculous standard is or I haven't taken some class by this organization or that. But my people see me as their Godi, and I have an obligation to fill to them based on this. And that is, a Godi is a position of obligation. When your folk trust you with that obligation, you're a Godi. Yeah. I would agree with you, Derek, and I think that's a great delivery and presentation on that. Um, so thanks for going into such an in-depth uh, answer. So um, I'm going to put a I, I see a question that came through uh, Facebook, a Facebook comment on, uh, on the Midgard Musings page. Um, and somehow I chopped off the name of the person. So um, we're going to put their name um, just kind of somewhere, uh, somewhere here on the screen uh, for you guys to see. This is the way we credit this person accordingly. Um, but the question is, is do you feel that Ossetru has been a trend? And do you feel like that trend is kind of dying down here recently? They notice that it may have possibly been a, a spike in interest and now it's decreasing or something and, and do we see or feel the same sort of thing you know um i think it's kind of plateaued i don't i don't know necessarily if it's decreased i still see a lot of content in some of the various social pl platforms that i peruse through mostly facebook and some of the youtube channels or whatever that i that i look at um there's a lot of content that's coming out regularly from various people that are covering different parts of their views of heathenry and, and whatnot. So I think it's maybe not spiked or spiking anymore. I think we've kind of reached a plateau. Um, but that's my own perception from what I've seen. Eric, I don't know what you noted or. I would say yes and no. Because, <laughs> like most things, it's not a simple answer. It's a complicated thing because, yes, there was an uptick in interest in Norse paganism, Asatru, heathenry, etc., uh, especially tied with the rise in popularity of the show Vikings. Um, that that really pulled a lot of stuff to the forefront. I mean, we had God of War, uh, the new one that focused on kind of Viking times and pulled in a lot of heathen mythos. Uh, and it's enough in the popular media that it we saw a little bit of a spike with that, but the rage of Vikings and everybody wanting to be a shield maiden or everybody wants to be Ragnar. Um, yeah, we got an uptick of people who superficially said they were interested in it. The reason I say yes and no is we have a yes in superficial interest, uh, but a no as far as actual uh, dedicated, like in the life heathens. We have a steady rise is what we have. Uh, I actually do not see it as plateauing. I see that a lot of the pop media stuff has lost interest in it, but a lot of that, again, has to do with global situations. Uh, everybody's distracted with something else right now. And so Vikings isn't in the, the mainstream media. We may see an uptick of it when uh, the new Assassin's Creed comes out, the whole Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Uh, 
just because, again, popular media, presence of the Norse pantheon in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, we saw the same thing with the Avengers when Chris Hemsworth stepped into Thor. There was a slight uptick. Vikings really was like the biggest uptick that I've seen. Uh, but all of that is in that superficial, wicked true, brosa true level stuff that I see. Most of it on the brosa true side of things. It's all superficial, cultural. Uh, there's no depth to it. I have, however, seen a steady increase in dedicated actual like serious heathens coming out of the woodwork. Um, I'm finding more and more people who are coming to me and saying that they found heathenry within the last year or two or in the last couple of years and are interested in learning more. They're reaching out to me on Facebook. They're reaching out to me on YouTube. Um, so I, I'm seeing growth there. I, I think... I was looking at a statistic the other day saying that and just how much uh, Asatru has taken over Iceland. Uh, I mean, Christians still outnumber them there, but it's rapidly rising as people return to folk ways that, you know, resonate with them. And so I think we're going to continue to see a steady rise. Is it going to be astronomical? No, I don't think we're going to turn around and suddenly double the number of heathens in North America by next year. Uh, but I do think there's going to be steady growth and I think that is definitely a reaction to global zeitgeist uh, in general over the last couple of decades. Uh, people are becoming disillusioned with the mainstream views and the forced indoctrination that they've gotten on a lot of things and are seeking out something more organic for themselves, something that's, that's truer to themselves. People are waking up and thinking. Uh, and thinking yeah. for themselves in a lot of ways that they just haven't before. So, uh, so yes and no. Yeah, and what it's neat to see too is, is that it's 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 not even so much. Um, I mean, of course, you know, our our area of focus is is Norse heathenry, Germanic paganism, um, and some of the various um, nuances that it surrounds. Whether you are going to be you know following an Icelandic model, whether you're going to be following an Anglo Anglo Saxon model, but um, another cool thing I, I um, notice is you know like you were talking about earlier, just the folk way. Um, of what happens to be your indigenous people's folkway, you know, connecting with our ancestors more, feeling that gravity well pull to areas that our ancestors um, lived in and in, in experienced. So it's not even necessarily just Germanic paganism. I see more people, you know, trying to tap into the um, old ways of their ancestors uh, to their respective regions, you know. Um, so like you say, that the organicness of it, the, uh, it, it's great to see. I think it's great to see because we're, we're, we're tapping more into the, the uh, ancestral side of things um, and learning about our ancestor spirituality um, and then developing um, our, our, our faith in, in that sort of way. So, all right, going back to uh, some YouTuber uh, questions. I've got three in line from the same person and their username on YouTube is Crit C. So Crit C has a question says, how do you learn to communicate, or sorry, commune? How do you learn to commune with and or pray to the spirits, ancestors, and gods? You wanna you wanna start with that one? <laughs> <laughs> how do you describe the How do you heathen, Eric? Blue? How do you heathen? Right. Right. <laughs> how how do you do? Um I have said this numerous times on my channel, and I, I just alluded to it, and it is absolutely my metaphor for this. Teaching someone to connect with the unseen is like describing the color blue to them. I can tell you all of the descriptors that we agree upon between each other that identifies the sky as blue. But when I look at the sky, the blue I see may not be the blue you see. The blue you see may be something I would define as green, and uh, I have no way of knowing because it is specific to your perception. And connecting to the gods and goddesses, connecting to the ancestors, connecting to the Vatir is all about your own perceptions. So how do you learn to do it? You do it. Um, you will go out and you will have experiences that are misses. You will go out and you will try and connect and you'll think you'll feel something and then nothing. Uh, that just happens. What I would say the best thing to do is just to keep doing it because the connection is there. Uh, the spirit world is always there. The connection is there. You can hone in your ability to 
bridge that gap and make the connection. That's what the whole ritual study thing is about. So study rituals, study different techniques that are used to bridge the gap. But the biggest thing is paying attention to your own perceptions. Look for things that are consistent during ritual. Learn to recognize signs. Learn to recognize uh, meaningful feelings and perceptions in the moment. Because a wind is a wind, but a sudden wind that comes out of nowhere and feels distinctly different from everything else preceding and after it just at the right moment in a ritual, that's a sign. Um, a bird flying by is a bird flying by, but it could be a sign. Um, sign interpretation is one way, um, but generally just feeling it and feeling that connection. The biggest thing that I can say on how you can learn to do it is learn to stop being afraid to do it. Uh, nobody is going to judge you because nobody's going to know. This is all about you and your interactions. So try and try and try again until you feel a connection. If you are not feeling it and you're feeling stressed out about it, you're worrying yourself too much about it. You really are. Um, don't get so hung up on, I have to feel and perceive this connection. Go ahead and go through the motions with all the right intentions, all of the right energies and all the right focuses in place, and then begin to look for results. And then begin paying attention to the feelings that you have while you're doing it. Because if you can do a ritual, you can have an increase in luck, you can see a result from this, then you can start to pay attention to your perceptions during the ritual, and you can begin to codify those experiences, and you will begin to recognize patterns. So uh, being able to tell you what it feels like, is it a tingle, is it a pull, is it an electricity across the skin, is it a presence in the back of the mind, is it a certain smell on the air, I don't know. It depends on how your brain interprets certain energies and what you're wired to focus in on. Uh, doing magical workings with anybody, and this is big in the woo-woo UPG side of things, but doing magical workings with anybody, one of the first things that you've got to do is establish what their sensory base is. Because some people see energy, some people feel energy, some people smell energies. I know somebody who could only do magic workings by the scent of what was going on. Uh, and that was not how I did it. So <laughs> translating yeah. between the two of us was difficult. Uh, but that's a key thing for you is to figure out how you perceive the connection. And the only way you can do that is through experience and experimentation. Yeah. And I like, I like how you said that it's um... – it's like, you know, it's kind of almost like a trial and error kind of thing because when, especially for the newbies or, or uh, especially for folks, you know, more or less just starting out um, learning the, the nuances and ins and outs of, of stuff, you know, you're going to get those mits, misses, you're going to get those hits. And um, don't be discouraged when you, you maybe don't feel something profound or you're, you don't think that you connected in any sort of way. You know, don't feel discouraged about that. Continue working on it because I know for me personally, you know, how I've established a um, communication between myself and the sacred, whether it be the sacred elements that exist in the profane, like the vatir of the land and, and, and the vatir of the home, um, and then how I communicate or, or connect with the gods and goddesses in, in, in that level. Um, it's been an ongoing thing for me. I've, I've learned how I can communicate with, for instance, my uh, husvatir, you know, what they like building that relationship the vatir of the land are a little bit more you know some things that work before don't work now and then you got to learn what they like now and how do you communicate and maintain that communication so it's a bit more sporadic um the gods and goddesses um it's just going to kind of be what it is and I, th I like what eric says you know there's certain auditory things that can indicate you know the reading of omens you know, how you pick up on certain things um what your sensitivity is uh, about all that so um, definitely do it. It's like we've been saying thus far, you know, when it comes to well, being a Godi or being a Vidki or being a this, be that. You got to do it, um, but don't be discouraged and don't be upset when you walk away from uh, a ritual or something. You're just like, hmm, that's, an, that's a learning experience. If you didn't feel something, it's not like, okay, well, what do I need to do to amp it up a bit or maybe change my approach, right? Yep. Sagas were not written about people who always meant to do something cool. Remember okay. that? That's a good. That's a good one, and that's the first time I've heard that. But I like that. 